We're live. Hi, I'm Mark Walling, professor of English at East Central University. I'd like to welcome you to the second session of the 2021 Scissor Tail Creative Writing Festival. Before we get started, I would like to let you know that our student literary magazine, Originals 2021, is hot off the press. You can email me at the email address you'll see in the chat box to uh, find out how you could purchase a copy, and we would greatly appreciate your support. There's some great work in it from the students at East Central. Um, those of you who are familiar with the Scissor Tail Festival will uh, know the quality of tonight featured, tonight's featured writer's work. Uh, those of you who are new, uh, well, you're in for a treat. Tonight's featured writer is Andrew Geyer. Andrew's ninth book, The Story Cycle, Lesser Mountains, won a 2020 Independent Publisher Book Award for U.S. South Best Regional Fiction. His other individually authored books are Dixie Fish, a novel, one of my favorites, Siren Songs from the Heart of Austin, a story cycle that won the silver, silver medal for short fiction in the Forward Magazine Book of the Year Awards and a Spur Award for short fiction from the Western Writers of America. He is the co-author with Jerry Craven and Terry Dalrymple of the hybrid story cycle Dancing on Barbed Wire. Andrew also co-authored Parallel Hours, <clears throat> an alternative historical sci-fi novel, and Texas 5x5, another hybrid story cycle from which one of his stories won a second Spur Award for short fiction. He co-edited the composite anthology A Shared Voice with Tom Mack, a member of the Texas Institute of Letters and the South Carolina Academy of Authors Literary Hall of Fame. Andrew currently serves as English department chair at the University of South Carolina at Aiken, and fiction editor for Concho River Review. It's my pleasure to introduce Andrew Geyer. Thanks, Mark. Um, first of all, I'd like to just say hello, shout out all you folks that would normally be at uh, in person, you know, in Ada at ECU, and we'd all be doing the family thing consuming beverages that might or might not contain alcohol and listen to each other read and just enjoying each other's company. And I really, really miss that. And I look forward, hopefully, to next year seeing my Sizzletail family again and to really being able to spend some time and catch up and hear your stories about the awful year and all that stuff. Um, but in the meantime, we're remote and that's what we've got, right? So, um, I really want to thank Ken Hayda for, for making this happen. Even, even though we're not live, we're sort of live, we're remotely live. And um, I'm coming to you from my attic office in my house. Um, so that's what's behind me there. You can see the sort of like the roof outline there behind my head. If my big old head doesn't to totally cover up the roof outline, right? Um, <clears throat> what I'm gonna to do tonight is I'm gonna read three pieces, time permitting. The pieces are linked, right? Um, a lot of you that have heard my work and read my work know that with the exception of the book I co-wrote with Jerry Craven, Parallel Hours, and the book I co-edited with Tom Mack, all my work's connected. All the books intertwine, the characters are shared, and the settings are shared. And so I'm going to focus on one particular character tonight. His name is Joe Jasmine. And um, I'm going to start him out in this book, which is Siren Songs from the Heart of Austin. It's currently being featured in a food blog. Shelley Workinger's food, food blog, it's called uh, bookfair. It's at bookfair.blogspot, right? And it's uh, called, But What Are They Eating? And you guys that have read uh, Siren Songs know that it's set in a restaurant, Aqua Vita Cafe in Austin. So um, check out Shelley's blog if you get a chance to, and you'll see um, a little bit about Siren Songs. Um, I'm going to read a very short piece called White Sands to begin with. It's from that book. Um, and it's about this character called Joe Jasmine. in. Um, in Siren Songs, Joe's living in Austin, and he's, how to put it, he's struggling, right? He's teaching at ACC, and they're not paying him enough to live on, so he's moonlighting as a waiter and trying to hold his marriage together, and this particular piece is from near the end of the book, and things aren't going well for the marriage, <clears throat> and the story's set at White Sands. I don't know if you guys have ever been out to the Tularosa Basin in New Mexico and seen White Sands, but it's amazing. If you, if you get a chance, you really need to go. It's a unique place in my experience, and I've been a lot of places in the world. Um, so 
what you need to know essentially about the story is that there are three colors that that sort of like fade into each other here white red and blue and those are all colors that if you're if you're there in the tularosa basin and white sands as the sun is setting you'll understand why i chose those colors to emphasize right so this story is called white sands <clears throat> white white is a world without an ocean white is sand as far as the eye can see these white gypsum dunes would be the most sensuous beach in the world if they only had an ocean to slither blue fingers across them. The dunes remember the sinuous touch of the incoming tide. In search of a body of azure curves, driven by a southwest wind that smells of desert mountains, the white waves of sand advance, growing, cresting, slumping forward to embrace a shallow inland sea that is no longer there. White evaporates. Like love in marriage, white vanishes into thin air. Gypsum comes from the Greek language, meaning to cook the earth. The dunes, some as high as 60 feet, consist of gypsum crystals deposited in an ancient ocean bed. Gypsum, a hydrous form of calcium sulfate, CaSO42H2O, is rarely found in the form of sand because it's soluble in water. Rain and snow fall on the surrounding mountains, dissolve gypsum from the rocks, and carry it down into the Tularosa Basin. Normally, the dissolved gypsum would then be carried by rivers to the sea. But no river drains the Tularosa Basin. The water, along with the gypsum it contains, is trapped. As the water evaporates, the dissolved gypsum is deposited onto the desert floor. Red. Red is Jacob's jacket. Red is a three-year-old blur rolling over and over down the slip face of a 60-foot dune. Red is a three-year-old boy's cries of joy. The red sun would rather be sinking into the sea than into the dry San Andres Mountains. Red is the color of my wife's hair. Unlike the dunes, which are blinding white as the surface of the moon, Elizabeth no longer seeks the embrace of an ocean. She sits in the shadow of a dune holding her knees, watching me slog up the slip face with Jacob choo-chooing on my shoulders. His red jacket flaps in the wind. The sand stings our eyes as we make the top of the slope in one headlong scrambling rush. We sit side by side on the crest of the wave. Jacob grins at me a grin as wide and white as a field of dunes. Blue. Blue is the color of Jacob's eyes. Blue is an absent ocean. Blue is a desert sky over soft white waves of sand. Blue is a feeling between two people that can never be recaptured as my son rolls over and over back down the steep slip face of the dune. White is gypsum. Gypsum is very soft, a two on the 10 point hardness scale where one equals talc and 10 equals diamond. The white sand glistens like diamonds when it catches the sun. My wife's fingernails, painted red, are a 2.5 on the hardness scale. My wife's red nails, which also glisten, could scratch the gypsum crystals like soft white skin. White is a function of wind. Strong southwest winds blow across the playa, pick up gypsum particles, carry them downwind. As the sand grains accumulate into dunes, they bounce up the windward slope, creating ripples on the surface. At the steep leading edge of the dune, sand builds up until gravity pulls it back down the slip face, moving the dune forward. White is suspension saltation, surface creep. White is the movement of sand. The wind whipping the gypsum into the air bleaches the horizon, fading the mountains gray white, making it seem as though the dunes are on the verge of achieving flight. The Great Lakes lie 1,400 miles northeast, directly downwind. I have never seen a Great Lake, but in pictures, they all look very blue. 
I wonder if the dunes, which have not felt the touch of a liquid body in more than 250 million years, would settle for fresh water and the absence of surf. Red is, three, is a three-year-old boy's prize of joy. Deep blue is the coming evening. White is the dunes seeking to stretch themselves out on thin air. The Gulf of Mexico, out of which the red sun rose this morning, is deep blue and salty, but it lies 800 miles away in a direction the wind never blows. It lies in the direction the three of us came from, the direction in which we will return home. But home lies far short of the ocean. Like the dunes, which are turning red now in the light of the setting sun, I have not touched a body of water in too long a while. The only time I have ever seen Elizabeth's body in the ocean was on our honeymoon. We swam naked in the Gulf of Mexico and afterward made love on the beach beneath the full moon. I am convinced Jacob was conceived that evening on the soft white sand just beyond the dark blue fingers of incoming tide. So that's Joe and Elizabeth, and they're they're just about done in that story at the end of that book. Um, and when you get into this latest book, Buster Mountains, Joe and Elizabeth are long since divorced, and Joe is trying to start his life over. Right? He's he's left Austin. He sold the house. He's he's looking for you know a way forward. <laughs> Right. And he, of course, meets another girl. Her name's Sarah. And um, and he and she, despite some difficulties across the, the arc of the plot of Lesser Mountains, wind up getting married and um, having a child together. Right. And so this next story that I'm going to read is Joe later in life in a way happier spot. Right? Not New Mexico. I'm not not I'm not saying New Mexico is not happy, but it wasn't happy for Joe. Right. Um, and so this story. It, it, it really connects with my life in a way that's that's sort of bittersweet, right? Um, the dog in this story, um, his name is Seamus Heaney, and I really did used to have a dog named Seamus Heaney, and he's not with us anymore. He's no longer in the land of the living. So reading the story, I read over it earlier just to sort of be ready to read it out loud. And I was thinking about old Seamus, and it was hard. So I, I don't know if you guys have ever lost a dog, but it's like losing a family member, man. And, um, and so if I cheer up a little bit when I'm reading this, it's because... I'm looking back at happier times with, with Seamus and, 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 and not having him around now, right? Um, so this story is called Adventures with Seamus Heaney and My Mother-in-Law, right? Um, spoiler alert, this has a happy ending. It's not a mother-in-law story, not really. It's about a dog, a little girl, and a modern-day American family that's a lot more like the Brady Bunch than Ozzy and Harriet. So I guess it could be about anyone or maybe everyone in these crazy new days. But my mother-in-law does figure prominently in the working out of the plot. The dog's name is Seamus Heaney, after my second favorite poet. And he is my dog, I guess, if it could truly be said that a dog belongs to anyone. It's probably more accurate to say that I'm his person. Seamus Heaney didn't start out to be my dog, but we'll get to that part of the story later on. The little girl's name is Ariel. Ariel's my stepdaughter, pale skinned and lovely, except for her dark hair. She's a miniature version of her mother, Sarah. Sarah is the love of my life. Jacob and Ben are the other members of our modern day Brady Bunch. Jacob is my son and Ben is Sarah's and my son together. The children are a tangled mix of half brothers and stepbrothers, half sisters and stepsisters. It's enough to boggle the mind especially during the holidays and summer visitations. But they all love Seamus Heaney in the rough and tumble way that kids love dogs. As for my mother-in-law, well, Belinda is the reason that Seamus Heaney, the dog, not his Nobel winning namesake, made the 160 mile trek from the Texas Hill Country to the Southwest Texas cattle ranch that I grew up on. The place that Sarah and I now call home and that the two of us together work when I'm not busy teaching. Despite Sarah's and my adamant refusal, 
I actually used the words over my dead body. My mother-in-law was absolutely determined that her granddaughter have a dog. I should probably pause to explain when an assistant professor of Latin chose to name a Welsh border collie after an Irish poet. Our orange tabby house cat, Virgil, named after my favorite poet of all time, might well answer, Cor non. But there are several reasons why I think, why that I think are pretty good, not the least of which is my Anglo-Irish heritage. My late father came from a family of no-nonsense English landowners, while my mother is descended from a brood of wild-eyed Irish ne'er-do-wells. Even more important is the fact that, like his Irish poet namesake, one of Seamus the dog's best things is digging. This is particularly the case when Seamus the dog feels that he hasn't been played fetch with enough by me, obviously still breathing despite losing the dog battle with Belinda, or rough and tumbled with enough by Ariel and Jacob and Ben. And like all great poets, Welsh border collies are wicked smart when it comes to language. There is a recorded case of a collie who knows and responds to more than 1,000 words of the Queen's English. Seamus the dog's favorite words include fetch, ball, squeaky, a beloved chew toy that makes a high-pitched squeal when bitten, outside, peanut butter, bone, wrestle, and go. His least favorite word is no, although he freezes instantly when he hears it. Surprisingly, the word fetch has also become a favorite word of mine. It turns out that there is no better therapy when the stress level of 21st century family life rises to a fever pitch than throwing a slobbery tennis ball to a black and white and brown streak of a dog whose eyes are afire with the pure joy of running. While the word no works wonders with Seamus the dog, it has turned out to be somewhat less effective when it comes to my mother-in-law. But before I can continue, I see that another explanation has become necessary. Belinda is not really my mother-in-law, although I refer to her in that capacity. She is actually the mother of Sarah's first husband, Ariel's father, David, who died driving drunk before Sarah and I met. So Belinda is Ariel's true blood grandmother, my own mother being her step grandmother. And Belinda has been more of a mother to Sarah than Sarah's own mother by blood, with whom Sarah has not spoken in over a decade. Crazy new days indeed. As I said earlier, Belinda is nothing if not determined. A regionally prominent, pra prominent practitioner of the art of fortune telling, I swear to God, who used to be Sarah's business partner at a combination coffee and tarot reading shop in San, on San Antonio Riverwalk called the Mystic Cafe, my mother-in-law has achieved excellence in her métier through the combination of talent and single-minded intensity that all great artists, including Irish poet laureates, share. After she bought out Sarah's majority stake in the Mystic Cafe and the business thrived, Belinda invested in a combination plant nursery and registered Welsh border collie farm in the Texas Hill Country. It was there that Belinda introduced Ariel to the black and white and brown puppy who would eventually be named Seamus Heaney. As an aside, Sarah and I used the buyout money from the cafe to build a new house where our family now lives, easy walking distance from the ranch house I grew up in where my own mother and by blood frequently host sleepovers for the kids, but back to the story. In addition to her mother's classic beauty, Ariel apparently shares her grandmother's considerable fortune-telling talent. And over the course of one summer's visitation between tarot reading sessions at the Mystic Cafe, Belinda took Ariel out to the Welsh border collie farm, farm where she became acquainted with a certain tiny, fuzzy, black and white and brown puppy who had not been born with his brothers and sisters' perfect markings. Make no mistake, Seamus is the scion of not one, but two noble and hence shockingly high dollar lines of show dogs. If not for the accident of his imperfect coloration, he would have been far beyond the modest means of a university professor and part-time rancher. This fact, relayed through the then eight-year-old Ariel, despite the fact that we were all on speakerphone, 
played a key role in my mother-in-law's strategy. Mama, little Ariel said, can I have a dog? One of the puppies here has fallen in love with me. Oh, honey, Sarah said, we could never afford one of those puppies. And besides, what would Virgil say? Super mortuum mayum corpus, I said. What was that? Belinda asked. Over my dead body, I said again in English. A translation I would come to regret in the fullness of time. Shh, Sarah said. We could afford this one, Ariel continued, as though I'd spoken not a word in either Latin or English. My grandma says that he's not perfect like the other puppies, so he only costs $100. Ariel, Sarah said, would you please take your grandmother's cell off speakerphone and hand it to her? The ensuing long distance difference of opinion featured several less than pleasant moments I'll not recount here. Relevant details include undeniably ungenerous com comments from a ranch-based husband, with the exception of Virgil at the Jasmine Ranch on the arid Southwest Texas Plains, the only animals that eat are the ones that work. Assorted objections from a practical wife who foresaw the difficulties a dog would add to already complicated holiday travel arrangements. And the single-minded persistence of a grandmother whose sole concern was the fact that her granddaughter had fallen in love with a certain black and white and brown Welsh border collie puppy. The tear-choked promises of that same dog-besotted granddaughter to feed said dog, wash said dog, and play with said dog every day figured prominently in each conversational pause. As a pair of practical and well-meaning, but heart-crushingly loving parents ever won an argument like this one? I contend that the answer is yes, although Belinda, who is a purist, argues otherwise. Admittedly, Seamus the dog came to live and to eat without working on the Jasmine Ranch. And of course, Ariel's tear-choked promises about dog care were fulfilled only for about the usual term of such desperate and emotion-fueled oaths. The duties of daily dog maintenance devolved upon Sarah and me. Sarah took over the dog washing chore. The feeding, watering, and playing with responsibilities are now mostly mine. But in my humble opinion, having taken a couple of years now to consider the question, these details are beside the point. In his Nobel lecture, Seamus Heaney, the Irish poet, said that as writers and readers, as sinners and citizens, our realism and our aesthetic sense make us wary of crediting the positive note. With all due deference to the late great poet and Nobel laureate, this has not been the case with Seamus the dog and me. Over the course of my newfound dog duties, I have become, to my great surprise, even more besotted with a certain black and white and brown Welsh border collie than Ariel ever thought about me. And I'm pleased to report that my love has been returned a thousandfold, literally. Sometimes happy endings do happen. For Seamus, the dog, and myself, the most positive note in our relationship has been our daily game of fetch. Every afternoon when I get home from my job at the University of San Antonio, I walk in the front door and set down my briefcase. Seamus bounds to the back door where he proceeds to bounce up and down. And I follow, pausing only to take a tennis ball from the dog pantry before we head out into the backyard. Then I throw and he fetches over and over and over again. He has trained me well. His favorite thing is for me to throw the ball up high so that it ricochets off the close cut carpet grass and he leaps after it snatching the yellow missile out of the air. The slobbery testament of his affection coats my fingers and palms like a glove as the stresses of full-time tenure track university professorship, part-time ranching, and holiday travel arrangements fade into throwing and leaping and catching ad infinitum. If saying that Seamus Heaney has become an integral part of our modern day Brady Bunch family means admitting that my mother-in-law was right, so be it. But in the broadest and most positive sense, aren't we all winners here? Belinda and Ariel, Jacob and Ben, Sarah and myself, and of course, Seamus the dog. If you wanted to press the point, 
I guess you could say that there actually is one loser in all this, our orange teddy house cat, Virgil, who is not exactly grown to love our family's, our family's newest addition. But then again, to paraphrase the Irish poet, happy endings don't work for everyone. So, Joe finds happiness at the end of Lesser Mountains, or near the end. It's not quite the last story, right? And I actually thought I was done with Joe. I thought Lesser Mountains and that's all, right? Joe's done, he's happy, he's there, he's good, he's got his dog, right? He's got his family, um, but it wasn't to be, right? So I started working on this new book, this, this book that I'm calling right now, All That Is Holy. And I started putting together the story, some of which you've heard me read at Scissor Tail, a couple of them, right? And by gosh, Joe just, he popped right back in there, right? Comes out, he's moved to South Carolina, and he's a unit head now at a university out there. And he's he's missing Texas, and he's he's thinking about life and trying to get settled into this new place. And yeah, so, so Joe. But here's what I did do, right? So... In All It Is Holy, there are four different plot lines that intertwine. It's, it's very similar to Lesser Mountains, you guys that have read the collection, right? The four plot lines kind of intertwine and tell their story. It's very novelistic, right? So I put all of the Joe stories in second person, right, to sort of differentiate them from the other plot lines. One of the plot lines is only in third, and, and one's in first, and one's a mix of first and third, and then Joe's is in second person. So I'm hoping that point of view kind of helps the reader keep people separate, but at the same time, move along, right? Um, and the story that I'm about to read is called Things Water Whispers to Limestone, and it's not yet published. Another version of it was selected to appear in the Viva Texas Rivers um, anthology that's going to be out, oh, in January, right, um, in down in Texas, but, um, but that version's in first person, and the version that I'm going to read is in second person. That's the version that will go in the book. Right. So without further ado, um, things, water whispers to limestone. And really quickly before I start, I don't know if anybody in the audience has ever been to the Frio River um, in Central Texas, but it runs very near where I grew up. And um, we used to go up for real in the summers in June. And um, it's a place where people go to tube. It's not really a, a river that you would canoe to the sea or whatever. Right. Um, but it's a place where um, Garner, Garner State Park is there. and um, and the river is mostly a recreational place for families, right? For, for kids and, and grownups and, um, and grandparents. And that's how I knew the Frio River. And that's the Frio that I'm writing about here, right? <clears throat> All right. Things water whispers to limestone. You were the only one who wanted to be the river. Of that motley crew of brothers and sisters and first cousins you grew up among, three boys and three girls, one wanted to be an astronaut, one a composer, one a fashion model, two weren't sure. You, the Frio River, seriously. You didn't just want to float on the river or swim in the river or smash feet first into the river from a boulder on a, work, on a rope swing. You didn't just want to haul bass and sunfish and catfish out of its clear and chilly depths. You wanted to be the river. Why? Reason number one was growing up on a working cattle ranch in Frio County, a ranch that the Frio River does not flow through. The only surface liquid for miles filled the 35-foot circular trough in the water lot, courtesy of the electric irrigation motor, or the smaller water troughs located at the bases of various windmills scattered across the brush and cactus-covered acreage of the jasmine spread. Anyone who has ever tried to swim in a 35-foot circular cattle trough should appreciate why a Southwest Texas ranch boy wanted to become one with the Frio River. Anyone who hasn't should take a look inside the mouth of a cow. Need a second reason? Think Southwest Texas, mesquite, scrub brush, prickly pear. The low rolling hills bristled with chaparral as far as the eye could see from the high home hill that your parents' ranch house sat atop there in your arid corner of the Chihuahuan Desert. Here's a challenge. Try not wanting to be the Frio River next time you make the dusty drive from San Antonio 
south down I-35, the Highway 57, and then west-southwest over the Kickapoo Lucky Casino in the pass. Number three, during a typical year in Frio County, one of the 90, oh, excuse me, of the 92 days spanning the months of June, July, and August, around 70 have high temperatures of 100 degrees Fahrenheit or above. And about 99.9% .9 of the ranch work you grew up doing was done outside. Anyone who's ever burned prickly pear in the middle of a summer drought with hungry cattle crowding around to gobble up the newly dethorned cacti the minute the spines are ash has absolutely wanted to be the Frio River, whether or not they realized it at the time. Now that the why of it has been established, focus on becoming one with the magical ribbon of 68 degree water that stretches 12 miles through the Frio River Valley from FM 1050 Bridge just above Garner State Park down to Neal's Crossing at Concan. Visualize floating at the base of the towering cliffs of Old Baldy and the clear river water with its sudden jets of coal from subterranean springs. Daydream about the majestic bald cypress trees lining both banks, festooned with dangling rope swings ready to fling wannabe Tarzans into the wide, warmer pools and swimming holes that get colder and darker the deeper you dive. Be mindful, though, of the limestone bed that can change without warning from slippery smooth to jagged, of the sudden rapids, of the hydraulics that lurk below the low head dams and crossings. The first week of June, after school let out, your Nana would always spring all six Jasmine kids, born within four years of each other, the progeny of a pair of brothers, her only sons, from the dry and dusty heat of your daily lives and haul you up to Concan where her lifelong best friend had a house on the freeway. While the kids were becoming one with the river, well, while one of you was doing your best to run life, your grandmother and her bestie and their cronies stayed at the house, sometimes at the domino table on the screen porch overlooking the river, and sometimes on the river bunk, on the riverbank with cane poles, and played 42 or hauled fish from the clear water while they drank and smoked and told tall tales. When you were little, even though you each had your own inner tube, the grown-ups made the smallest of you wear life jackets. Nana's best friend's husband had an old Ford truck, a faded pea green stepside with a wooden bed, and he would stuff all of you into the back with your tubes and haul you up to the FM 1050 bridge, strap a neon orange life vest onto each squealing victim, and then release you into the river. He would always wait until the last of you disappeared around the bend at the foot of Old Baldy. Then he'd head back to the doings at the river house and you'd shuck your life vests and float through Garner State Park together and on down. This was long before every suburbanite in Austin and Houston and DFW had discovered that magical 12 mile ribbon of the Frio and converged. So once you got through Garner, particularly if it was a weekday, you'd have long stretches of river pretty much to yourselves. Remember floating that first three miles through Garner, dodging the paddle boats and the swimmers, then clearing the low head dam at the foot of the park and trying not to be the first to flip? Remember scooting over the old Lakey Road at Major's Crossing, still trying not to flip, then scooting over the river road at Seven Bluff Crossing and feeling pretty good if you still hadn't flipped, and then clearing another low head dam and shooting through the little rapid below it? Remember floating on down into the chute where the limestone banks closed in tight and a series of standing waves almost always made at least some of you flip? Remember recovering your tube? It seems like you were almost always the first one who flipped. And heading on down to the gleeful madness of Comanche Crossing, and after a lazy half mile shooting up under the bridge at Kenneth Arthur Crossing, then winding on down through the Boulder Garden Rapid and into the three and a half foot drop at the falls, where you nearly always flipped, all of you, especially if you didn't stay to the right. Remember finally taking out on the beach at Neal's, even though you had your own tubes, and then enjoying the best swimming hole in the state of Texas until that old pea green Ford came and hauled you back to the river house. You had the time of your life. As the years passed, the smallest of you 
finally got to leave your life best behind at long last when you were teenagers. Some of you even left behind your attitudes. In their place, you brought along snorkeling gear and floated and swam through the clear river water down to Concan. Of course, you still enjoyed the boulder diving and the rope swings and the swimming hole at meals. But those last couple of goggles and fins trips down the river were the closest you ever came to becoming one with the Fluyo. The whisper of water over rocks <clears throat> is almost comprehensible to the submerged ear. You always thought that maybe if you could just translate a couple of syllables, you could learn the river's language, that you could come to know the things water whispers to limestone. As the years passed though, the river got more and more crowded. The boulders didn't tower quite as high. The rope swings didn't fling you quite as fast or far. And the swimming holes didn't seem quite as deep. Divorce came for your uncle's family and your rambunctious band of brothers and sisters and first cousins was divided across the Lone Star State. And of course, as you grew through adolescence into adulthood, your wannabes changed into realities. The six of you scattered across the country. One is now a partner at a tech firm in DFW by way of the Air Force. One is a homemaker in San Antonio. One is in the penitentiary in Wisconsin. Two are in trailer parks. One is a university professor turned department chair in South Carolina. You don't see each other anymore and you don't talk much, even on Facebook. But you think of them often, particularly when you're in your beat up old green canoe, paddling your way down yet another river in the river. You still listen just as intensely to the whisper of water over limestone rocks. And you're still hoping to figure out those first two key syllables. But sometimes, especially when you're camped below a little rapid and the Milky Way is splashing starlight into the river, you take a break from listening and wonder whether any of those other five still remember the magic of your time together during the first week of every gym. When you die, you will be cremated. Your wife, Sarah, has promised to scatter your ashes in the three or four places that have the greatest significance to you. One of those places is the 12 mile stretch of heaven that so occupied the thoughts and dreams of a Southwest Texas ranch boy. So the day will come when you finally do achieve your original wannabe and become one with the freedom. In the meantime, you will remember. You will remember the river. Thank you so much, Andrew. This is wonderful work. I'm sure everyone uh, enjoyed it and uh, was glad that we could have scissor tail in this form. Um, in the future, we'll hope to gather again in person and we hope to see you and everyone again next year. But this is wonderful. Uh, thank you again so much. It's great to see you and great to hear your work. You can uh, obtain copies of Andrew's work at the links that you've seen in the chat box. Uh, tomorrow at four o'clock, we will have session three with Tiffany Midge and uh, hope to see you all then. Thank you again, Andrew. And good night, everyone.